Hurry up and give yourself a raise. Welcome to Go Vote Omaha, presented by the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha. I'm Tia Spears, a league, member, a league member and your host. Today, I have with me Charlene Ligon, author of Fearless, which commemorates her mother, Evelyn T. Butts, and her efforts in eliminating the poll tax. Evelyn, how are you? Charlene, how are you? <laughs> oh, just great. Thank you. And thank you for having me. All right. Can you tell us about the legal challenge your mother, Evelyn, took all the way to the Supreme Court? Well, certainly. Um, it was the poll tax suit. And originally, uh, the suit was filed in 1963, and that's where the process, it, 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 you know, through the courts in Virginia. It's in, uh, I'm originally from Norfolk, Virginia, and, and that's where my mom, my mom lived, my family lived in Norfolk, Virginia. And it went all the way through the uh, Virginia court process, and then it went to the Supreme Court in 1966 is when they heard the case. And basically the poll tax was, uh, you had to pay the vote. And to make it, uh, I guess to com compound the uh, negative aspect of it, you had to have that poll tax played uh, six months prior to the election. And also, uh, if you weren't a property owner, you wouldn't get a bill for the poll tax either. So uh, it was, and it was especially, um, and it, uh, it was an impediment to the uh, poor, to poor people, not only African Americans, but anyone that did not have the money. Now it was a small amount; it was a dollar fifty cents at that time in 63, but also if you had not paid it, you wind up, would wind up having to pay several years because they penalize you. So it wound up being about $10, but you just think about it during that time. Uh, poor, you, you know, poor people in the uh, late 50s, early 60s did not have that spare uh, money to uh, pay, especially to pay to vote. Right. You wrote a book about this case and your mother. Uh, the cover is an image of Evelyn T. Butts as she waited for a photo to be taken by the Associated Press uh, photographer outside the U.S. Supreme Court. Why did you select this photo? Well, it's a powerful photo. It, it shows her, uh, the pillars of the court behind her. And uh, uh, she, she has an a exp uh, expression on her face that she looks determined that she's she was going to win that uh, case, so uh, that's why I chose that one. Yeah, I, I think it. You know, we talk about the poll tax, and I talk about the poll tax in the book, and a lot of it is devoted to the poll tax. But there's so many other facets to my mom's uh, political career. Uh, she didn't just start with the poll tax. Uh, she did other things before that. She had always been really active in uh, uh, the community. And uh, uh, if you know uh, Virginia and know what Virginia was like in the 50s, you will know about Jim Crow laws. So those are the things that she fought against. And in 1954, when the Supreme Court uh, uh, said that there would be no more segregated schools in the nation, is really, really when she started to get really active. I see. What plans are there upon the release of your book, Fearless, to integrate educational programs into schools? Well, you know, I haven't uh, uh, thought about that or even, you know, I was uh, lucky to get that uh, endorsement for, uh, from Chuck uh, Robb, former governor and U.S. Senator from Virginia, and he talked about every high school uh, student should read that. But it wasn't any, it, it's, it's not anything I had planned. So maybe in the future, if people, you know, the book is uh, due out November the 30th. So if it's received that well, then great. All right. Yeah, we are across that bridge, I guess. We'll we hope there. it will. <laughs> yeah. Your mother was deemed one of the most influential political leaders of the last three decades by the Senator of Virginia. Considering the breadth of her accomplishments and her impact on Virginia at that time, how did you choose a starting point when you sat down to write this book? Well, you know, this is a book about my mom's life and also our family heritage. And so I started at the beginning uh, 
and not to give away a lot of the book, but we had one, uh, uh, you know, actually I started our family off in, uh, in Virginia, it's Virginia Beach now, but it was Old Princess Anne County, a place called Bird Neck Point. And my great-great-grandfather was, uh, was a slave there. And he ran away from the, uh, the uh, plantation in 1863 after Abraham Lincoln, as uh, an Emancipation Proclamation said that uh, colored uh, men could, could fight for the Union. So he left Virginia Beach and went to Norfolk, which Norfolk had been pretty much uh, uh, still part of the Union, you know, even though the uh, capital of the Confederacy was Richmond, Virginia, but Norfolk was, you know, uh, still controlled by the Union. So he went there in 1863 and joined the uh, Union and fought for the, uh, the U.S. for its freedom and then went back to the plantation. That's a really compelling story. In 1865, story. yeah. You describe your mom as a mover and a shaker and being unafraid to speak her mind, which tremendously helped her pursue this case. What advice do you think she'd have for anyone seeking to challenge legislation? Oh, well, I know she would say you need to be informed. You need to know what's going on in your community, your city, your state, and the country. And then you need to, uh, when you, uh, you need to stand up. You need to challenge. By all means, you need to challenge those laws uh, that you uh, think are unjust. And you need, just really need to participate in and pay attention to, you, to your community and be a part of your community, not only those things that might be negative, but the positive part of your community also. I see. Yeah. How challenging was it, if at all, to convey your mother's tenacious spirit and accomplishments in your book? Oh, it wasn't difficult. Uh, the difficulty I had was at, at, at portions of her political career, there were obstacles. Mm -hmm. There were some impediments. And politics being politics, some ruthlessness <laughs> sometimes also. So that was the most difficult, and that was pretty much at the, um, at the end when she was starting to, uh, to wind down. Your mom is credited for establishing the present, presence of minorities in elected offices. She registered over 3,000 African Americans in a course of six months, and she served Norfolk citizens with, um, through her elected positions for years. How can her impact on the Norfolk community be measured? Well, you know, I think it can be measured. I, you know, we, uh, you know, I did the research when I was the book, uh, writing the book. But when they started off, they didn't have any uh, African Americans on the uh, city council. And this was really the first person that started to run was in the 50s, African American uh, person. And finally in 1968, they got the first uh, African American elected to the uh, city council. But now, it's actually four African Americans on the school board, four whites, half and half. Four women, which she was a big uh, feminist, she was a huge feminist also, so four women. And uh, they're also, uh, the mayor of Norfolk is African American also. So uh, it, it has been a huge uh, impact, and the impact is participation. Everyone needs to vote. I see. Yeah. Your mother's hero was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Tell me how she used her inspiration as a tool to pursue her actions as a political community leader. Well, you know, she believed in uh, Martin Luther's, Luther King's uh, doctrine, which is nonviolence, uh, uh, civil disobedience, but like I said, uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. Believed that uh, want justice, you know, to, uh, to conquer the injustice, rather, in, in our nation. And she carried forth, and she did that, and, you know, as she participated, like, uh, the things in the community, uh, equal employment. Uh, I remember, and I, it's in the book about her and her friends, and this was 1959. Uh, they did a, a 
a picket of a grocery store at the end of the street. Now, and it served the African American community, but the jobs were not, you know, the, the best paying jobs were not African American, you know. They would hire a cashier that was black. Or, you know, the, the people in the store that worked in the store were, uh, the black people were either uh, stockers or cleanup or janitors. But none of, no management, nothing like that. And, you know, 90% of the, uh, of the people, of their revenue came from African Americans. But that's just the way it was back, you know, during that time. But, you know, make a long story short, I want to go into it and, and people can <laughs> read about it in the book. I won't tell, I won't say the outcome, so. All right. Describe to me what it was like to grow up in your mom's household before, during, and after she pollute, pursued the political and civic endeavors that she did. Well, you know, I, I don't remember when she wasn't pursuing that. Uh, because she always, you know, as I, I'm the youngest of the family, mm -hmm. so uh, she was always active in PTA and what we call uh, Civic League. Uh, that was our community organization, and we were at, at one particular, I think Norfolk was annexed by the city of Norfolk in 1955. Originally had been part of what they call Old Norfolk County, which doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our area was a rural area, so they talked about redeveloping it, and that's something our community did not want. If they wanted anything was improvement, but not to relocate the people. So what she did, she at, at, uh, became president of that civil league and remained president for a lot of years, but she carried that through and made sure, as a neighbor said, she was in City Hall's face every, you know, mm -hmm. every chance she got. And we did get, uh, you know, sidewalks and, and pipe water and those things, you know, city sewer. And they didn't redevelop, so uh, it kept everyone in, in the same neighborhood. I see. Your mom was involved a lot within the, within the community, as we discussed already, um, even after she went to the Supreme Court to contest the poll tax. Right. Um, eventually, they adopted the 24th Amendment, which outlawed poll taxes as a requirement for voting. Um, she was also the chairman of the second congressional district for the Democratic Party, and she served on the Citizens Advisory Committee, and she did a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. How do you use the knowledge and lessons from all of her different roles in the community as a member of the Nebraska Democratic Women's Caucus? Well, you know, just to encourage uh, uh, the women to participate, to volunteer. We always need volunteers, but you always need to give back, so that's a good way to give back. But, you know, they're always, you know, just like now, you look at what's going on in our nation, and we know we need uh, guidance now. And so uh, we need volunteers, we need people, as she did, she was always a volunteer, but she uh, went out, registered voters, and the most important thing, of course, is vote. But to, it, to participate, like uh, get out the vote, we call GOTV, but then there's a portion even before we get out the vote, we do a lot of uh, uh, contact with voters. So we either we're calling them or we're knocking on their doors and we're talking about issues. And that's exactly what she did. She was a grassroots uh, person, mm -hmm. and that's what we need, uh, grassroots. Uh, roots of uh, participation. What's the greatest message you hope for your readers to grasp after they read your novel? Not novel. Book. Book. <laughs> it's kind of biography. But uh, we, um, I want them to understand that they need to engage, they need to pay attention to what's going on nationally, statewide, in the local government. They need to ensure that, uh, and I know she, she would feel this way, that we aren't moving backwards. Because at this particular time, I think we are probably moving a little bit backward now. And so, but vote, that's what she always, that was her, uh, uh, 
you know, she registered all of those voters, like 3,000 voters, but even at, at that particular time, but she, you know, after that, she was still registering thousands of voters or setting up drives so others could register voters. So registering voters is important, but turning them back out is the most important. I see. Are there any plans to create a series about the efforts of other individuals involved in the polishing the poll tax? No, uh, this was just this book was written because I wanted to preserve, preserve my mom's legacy. You know, she, I have kids. She has, you know, grandkids, great grandkids, and they go on, so they would know about her. But not only her. Uh, in my book, uh, there is, uh, you know, family history also. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's for our family, but it's also. Uh, hopefully an inspiration uh, for people to know, because my, my mom was a special person. She was just an ordinary citizen. Mm -hmm. So an ordinary citizen can do what they, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, challenge the government. Mm -hmm. We're focused on your mother, but how did you come to be in Nebraska? What work brought you here? Well, I'm retired from the Air Force. Um, I, uh, we arrived here uh, in Nebraska, rather, in Bellevue. Uh, I was uh, stationed at Offutt Air Force Base in 1992. I was a meteorologist in the Air Force, or weather forecast, whatever you, you call it. And uh, I did that for over 20 years. Uh, and my husband and I both retired in 1995. So that's how I got here. And we like Nebraska <laughs> specifically because it's not crowded. Back east is pretty crowded. Yeah. And, and so we decided to stay. Awesome. What community issues here have you worked on? Oh, um, a lot. <laughs> I, uh, I'm really active in the uh, Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm chair of the Sarpy County Democrats, and I'm also secretary of the Nebraska Democrat Party. Uh, though, that keeps me pretty uh, busy, but I do a little web design, and that, I, that's what I do for Sarpy County and some candidates. And I do uh, things like that, but those are mostly my hobbies. But my, my community service is, uh, getting, uh, uh, participating with the party, but also, you know, I got bit by the bug when Barack Obama, really, you know, I've always been really uh, attentive uh, to what's going on, but I got bit, bit by the bug then, and I started to register voters. So I, could knew that I knew that's how I could have an impact on the election, you know, following my mom's lead. You register the voters, and then you go back and you turn them back out and, and to vote. That's, that's most important. Um, what advice do you have for getting involved in the community and working on public policy issues? Well, I would say uh, uh, monitor the legislature uh, in, in Lincoln. And uh, you, you, know, you, can, you can go to Lincoln and observe, or you can watch it on uh, TV. And also, you can watch it over the internet. And uh, I would say that's a starting point. point. But you can uh, write letters to the editor. It's a real, uh, to let people know how you feel and, and try to uh, uh, persuade uh, public policy in that uh, fashion also. But you need to always contact your, um, your uh, lawmakers, not only local, uh, local lawmakers, but call you know, our uh, congressmen, call you know, the senators. So that's. Yeah. Evelyn is created or credited for establishing the presence of minorities in elected offices, registered over 3,000 African Americans in the course of six months, and served the citizens of Norfolk for years through elected positions. From your experience, how can her impacts on the Norfolk community be measured? Uh, that's by the elected officials that we have. We have, uh, uh, like I say, it's half-half. When we, she started out, it wasn't any elected officials, really, at all. And at the city level, there's about half-half, but also 
the legislative uh, uh, level. There are a couple of us that serve in the General Assembly and also the state senator. We have, not, unlike Nebraska, we have two houses. Uh, we don't have a unicameral like here. I think Nebraska is the only one with the unicameral. So uh, we have that, that impact. But I can just see the uh, change in Norfolk in the projects she worked on. She, my mom also served as a commissioner on the Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority. And there she uh, is, unlike Nebraska, they oversaw the redevelopment of the whole Norfolk. And they did several phases of it. And she was particularly uh, 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 favored a project called Waterside that's there now, but it was a redeveloping of the waterfront because the waterfront in Norfolk had turned into a, a slum. And, you know, it was really, it looked bad, but not only looked bad, we, it, it wasn't bringing any tax revenue into the city. So uh, that's what, that was one of her pet projects, believe it or not. So my mom was an all-around person she did a lot of she did a lot of things. It wasn't just the poll tax, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, so people would know. Well, she she's really nationally known for the poll tax, but she did not only the registering of voters, but she had uh, uh, organizations that did uh, G, uh, well, get out the vote and register uh, uh, back candidates and recruited candidates and that kind of thing also. There's a picture on your website for the novel of your mother with Virginia Governor Chuck Robb. What mm -hmm. can you tell me about her relationship with him and his sentiment, sentiments about her efforts in uh, getting the poll tax abolished? Well, actually he wasn't involved in getting the poll tax. Uh, he wasn't involved at all. He was, uh, ran for, as a matter of fact, he was Lieutenant Governor, Governor, and then a U.S. Senator from Virginia. But he was, he, uh, my mom was uh, one of the people that backed, backed him. And uh, he actually, uh, she was one of his supporters, I guess that's a better word for it. And uh, they became great friends. And it's something in my book about it, and I won't talk about it. He, they would have to read the book to find out the story. But Chuck Robb, I guess, by anything, where a lot of people will know him, it's because he's married to uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's daughter, uh, Linda Bird uh, Johnson. So it's Linda Robb now. And he also served, his latest thing, he served on the 9-11 Commission. But he, he didn't really have anything to do with the poll tax. He came along, I think, probably about 1979. So it was later in her career. And he uh, sought her support, is what it comes down to. So. All right. The release date of Fearless is November 30th, 2017, retailing at $28.99. Uh, viewers, you can purchase this novel at the link on your screen. Charlene, is there anything else that you would like to share with our viewers of the show today? Well, um, and, and other than to uh, uh, encourage everyone to, we have le elections coming up here in Nebraska next year. Encourage everyone to participate and to uh, uh, vote your heart, but please vote. And uh, uh, because voting is your voice. And you can't complain if you don't participate. And so uh, my uh, call is for voter turnout. All right. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha and Go Vote Omaha, I'm Tia Spears. Have a great night.